Hello and welcome to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about the exposure triangle. What is it? How is it used? And how can it help you in your production? Uh, we'll be answering those questions and more. Stay tuned. So what is the exposure triangle? The exposure triangle is the name collectively given to three camera and lens functions. Those three functions are aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. These three functions are used to control the amount of light that's hitting the camera sensor and directly affecting the image quality. And that's why the exposure triangle is so important. One, it gives you a framework to how to get the best possible image every single time. Two, it gives you a language that you can use to communicate with your crew so that everybody's on the same page. Three, it helps you plan your production. You know what lens to use, what cameras to use, what lights to use. And it saves you a lot of time and hassle. Okay, let's get to know these functions a little more. So the first function we're gonna be talking about is the aperture. Now the aperture is located inside the lens. Now in a fixed camera system, it's a little difficult to see, but on a lens, you can see the aperture. So the aperture has five or more blades that can be adjusted by rotating the aperture ring. And when you're rotating the aperture ring, the aperture opening becomes wider or narrower. So let's see if we can see this right now. The aperture is wide open. So I'm gonna close that aperture and there you go. Now it's all the way closed and that's all the way wide open. Two reasons why this is very important. One, of course, it controls the amount of light that's entering uh, the sensor and how bright your image is gonna be. And number two, it determines how much of the image is in focus. That is, it determines the depth of field. A wide open aperture means a narrow depth of field. A narrow aperture means a wide depth of field. So your depth of field ultimately determines how much of your image is in focus. And you can move your depth of field forward and backward by moving the focus ring of your lens, which will adjust the focus point. So, for example, this camera has a shallow uh, depth of field, which means Everything that's in the foreground and in my background is out of focus, but I am in focus. On the flip side, if you see my second camera, you can see that almost everything is in focus. And that's because this camera has an aperture opening that is smaller. Typically on a lens, the aperture is marked as numbers. You can see here, as I move that aperture ring, that number changes. So typically your aperture can go anywhere from as low as 1.8 or 2.8 for this lens all the way up to 22. So typically you see most lenses go all the way up to 22, but it's that smaller number is what varies from lens to lens. And you calculate the aperture opening from this number by dividing the focal length of your lens by the aperture number. So, for example, for this lens, uh, if I take the example of my uh, focal length to be 125 millimeter and my aperture is 2.8, that'll give my aperture opening to 44.64 millimeters. That's a wide open aperture. So that means that I can get a shallower depth of field with this lens. But if you take this lens, which is a electronic lens, so I can't manually rotate my aperture ring. I have to connect it to a camera to be able to change it. But for this lens, the number, the lowest number that the aperture will go to is four, which means at uh, 35 millimeter, that aperture opening is going to be 8.75 millimeters. So that's a pretty small aperture opening, which means this will keep everything in focus. 
So this lens is great for establishing shots because it's a 16 to 35 millimeter. And if I want to show everything in a large room or like a landscape or a house and I want to see all the detail because there's information going on everywhere, this is the lens to go with. Now, if I want a more personal shot and I want to showcase my character's emotion or just isolate something in scene, this is the lens that I would go with. That's how the aperture affects your image quality. And you can use that information to know when to use what lens for your scene. Now, let's move on to shutter speed. The shutter speed is also known as exposure time. And it determines how long the camera shutters stay open when taking a picture. Now, if the shutter is held open longer, a lot more light hits your camera sensor. And if it's held open for a shorter time, a lot less light hits your camera sensor. So shutter speed is typically marked as one by a number. Depending on the camera, your shutter speed can go all the way up to 30 seconds and all the way down to one one thousandth of a second. And that's a good way to think about shutter speed as slices of time is what fraction of a time do you want to take a picture? In cinematography, uh, your shutter speed is always uh, determined by your frame rate. So um, your shutter speed value will be one by twice your frame rate. If you have a frame rate of 24 frames per second, then your shutter speed is going to be one by 48. So if you want to film something in slow motion, then you want to change your frame rate to something higher, like 60 frames per second and set your shutter speed at one by 120. The lowest possible shutter rate you can go in video is one by 48 and that's because the lowest frame rate you typically go is 24 frames per second. In photography, there is no such restrictions because you are just taking one frame, one slice of time. So you can change your shutter speed as much as you want depending on your situation. For example, if you're filming a sports event, then you can set your shutter speed or exposure time to a very small number. So your shutter speed can be one one thousandth of a second. So you're capturing those fast high speed moments that look like a still frame in time. So that's where you use higher shutter speeds. Long exposures, especially in photography, that's where you use exposure time that's longer. You typically set an exposure time that's 30 seconds or one second, those kind of little motion blur tricks you can do with uh, shutter speed. And that really is the biggest uh, visual function of shutter speed is motion blur. This is really appealing in film and photography. That's pretty much it for shutter speed. The last function we're going to be talking about is ISO. So ISO determines the sensitivity of your camera sensor. To really understand ISO, we have to go back in time and talk about film and a time before digital cameras. If you've ever used a film camera and bought film stock, you know that there's two things you always have to make sure that your film stock is rated for. One is if it's balanced for daylight or tungsten light, which now you can easily change in a digital camera with white balance. And the second thing you always look out for is the film speed. Film speed is a number given to film stock and that denotes the sensitivity of film. So typically if you're filming a scene indoors, you want a, you're under the assumption that there's not a lot of light and you want a film stock with sensitivity somewhere between 400 and 800. And for exterior shots, where you know that there's going to be a lot of light, you want the film stock somewhere between 100 and 400. Back in the day, when there were multiple producers of film, they followed multiple different standards. So, you know, 100 might mean something in one standard, 200 might mean something else in some standard, right? So there was a lot of uh, confusion, let's say. So, in 1974, an organization was formed to standardize that number, that 100 meant 100 throughout. So that organization was called the International Organization for Standardization. And that's where ISO comes from. 
So those numbers still equate to the sensitivity, sensitivity of film stock. But the big difference is that, you know, in film stock, you're bound by it. You know, if it's, a, if it's rated for 100, that's it. There's no adjusting it. But in a digital camera, you have that freedom to go from 100 to 1000 and in some cameras even more, right? Now, the biggest thing you got to realize is that ISO does not magically improve the quality of the sensor. So when you are going to those higher ISO numbers, you will see a lot of noise. So you always have to be careful when you're using higher ISOs. In cinematography, you tend to avoid it. We still stick to the film speed standards of if it's an interior shot, stick to 400 to 800. Exterior shots, stick to 100 to 400. And you're always using extra lights to make it brighter or using negative cloths and diffuser to make it uh, a lot less brighter. But in photography, that rule doesn't apply. You can always go higher or lower. Make sure you pick a ISO value where you don't get too much noise, but enough so that your scene is exposed well. And that's it for the ISO. So to sum up, we learned what the exposure triangle is, how it's used, and how you can use it in your production. I'm just going to uh, sum up the last two questions here. Knowing more about the exposure triangle means that you know more about how a camera system works, which means if you know what you're going to film and if you have an idea visually of how you want your frame to be, then you can pick your camera, your lens, way before your production even starts. And you can even have standardized set of ISO, shutter speed, and uh, aperture settings for your production. Just so everybody's on the same page, especially on productions that go multiple days, spread over multiple months, it's a great idea to have created all these little standard documents so that the next time you go into your production and you're wondering what did I use for a medium shot or a close-up shot, you have it all documented. And it can speed up your production uh, so much. You can even take it a step further by getting a light meter. A light meter will instantly tell you how much light is hitting a subject and what the right exposure setting is. So if you go in with a light meter, you immediately get an uh, f-stop number value of how much light is there so you can determine well if do I need more light or less light because remember if you do want a shallow depth of field you need to have that um, uh, aperture wide open which means you need to have exactly the amount of right amount of light so that your uh, subject isn't overexposed or underexposed can always do a trial and error with cameras and lights but a light meter makes your life a lot easier and that's it for all three functions of the exposure triangle thank you for watching hope that was helpful hope that was useful hope you learned a lot uh, if you have any questions please feel free to leave it in the comment section and i will get back to you as soon as i can um, until next time bye